This is the Six Man Show, an Orlando Magic podcast, with your hosts Luke Sylvia and Jonathan Osborne, covering all things Magic basketball by fans for fans. Go Magic! What's going on, Orlando Magic fans? You guys are back with the Six Man Show. Today is March seventeenth, two thousand twenty-two. My name is Jonathan Osborne, as always, joined by my co-host, Luke Sylvia. Luke, what's going on, bro? Uh, not much, man. I Aside from the fact that, that, that Kyrie dropped 60 last night on our magic, it's a good time for me because March Madness, as you guys are listening to this, could be going on as you listen to this, depending on when you do, uh, starting today, and we get nonstop basketball um, here all day. I believe the first game tips off around noon Eastern. The uh, last game of the day tips off around 10 or 11 Eastern, I think. And there's just games continuous throughout the day. It's beautiful. If you guys don't have the March Madness live app on your phone, it's awesome. You just can access every game that's going on from there. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's holiday season for me right now, Jonathan. So the first four, uh, those games are going on tonight. Wright State beat Bryant. Mm-hmm. And then at 936, we're recording, like in four minutes, we're recording this around 930. Uh, Wednesday night, Notre Dame versus Rutgers. That's going to be pretty interesting. If there. you guys are still tweaking your bracket, I think you need to take a hard look at Rutgers. I've got uh, Rutgers as of now. Now, now, if they lose tonight, this doesn't really count. But as of now, I have Rutgers going uh, to the Sweet 16, I believe. So, um, so yeah, so I, I think they're good. UCLA was the 11 seed that did it last year. They made, I believe, to the Final Four. They lose to Jalen Suggs on that uh, half-court game winner. So it's possible, man. And and UCLA did it through a playing game as well. So I, I'm going Rutgers uh, to go deep. If Notre Dame wins today, thankfully I can still tweak my bracket before the game start tomorrow, and I will have it looking different. Notre Dame, I will not have them. I don't think they're fit to go for a far at all. Well, I mean, for the most part, you know, I'll be paying attention to Gonzaga, mm-hmm. Duke, Auburn, you know, Purdue, uh, you know, in terms of the NCAA tournament. But – in terms of the teams, I'm looking tomorrow, 4.30 TBS, North Carolina mm. takes on Marquette, mm-hmm. 8 versus 9. So 8 versus 9, you just, you never know what's going to happen. Never and, uh, your, t- after your heels losing, are in three-and-a-half point spread. So Yeah, after losing uh, to Virginia Tech in the ACC tournament, which you know Virginia Tech went on to win the ACC tournament, you know they beat Duke as well. Um, you know, I haven't really been all that confident about the Tar Heels this year, but uh, excited to, you know, hopefully uh, – a sweet 16 elite eight berth. I, I would be pretty happy with that, but yeah. Yeah. March madness. You got to love it. Yep. There's a lot of games tomorrow, Jonathan. The last thing I'll say games to look for forward to Indiana 12 seed versus five seed. St. Mary's St. Mary's only favored by two points tomorrow. Creighton, San Diego state. That's a nine, eight game as well. San Diego state favored by two. Um, and you've even got uh, San Francisco 10 seed against seven seed Murray state. Murray State's coach is looking at a lot of Power 5, Power 6, I guess, jobs in college right now. He's up for a lot of those, but his team is currently a 7 seed, Murray State. They're favored by 2. So there's a, there's a lot of a lot of fun games tomorrow throughout the day. I'm I'm excited. Look, real fast before we get into uh the magic here. I've been meaning to ask you. I haven't seen it yet, but I know you went and saw The Batman. Mm. Our uh, very own Kevin Tucker mm-hmm. said it was good. Didn't say great. He said it was good. I'm curious to hear your thoughts about the Batman because everybody's kind of raving about it. Yeah, yeah. Kev Kev said good, and he wouldn't like budge to give it more of a compliment than good. He said it was good. I could hear him saying it in his actual tone, and it kind of irritated oh, me boy, a little bit. I could go. hear it, you know. And, and he was saying it was good. It was good. It wasn't, you know, it was good. I I paid for it. It was worth it, right? Um, it was great, Jonathan. I don't want our friend Kevin to deter you from going to see it. Oh no, he it's, wasn't. No. It is all I, of, not that I don't respect his opinion, but the movie I've very much been looking forward listen, to. Listen, the consensus is that it's a good movie. Like it's a great movie. Two hours and like 56 minute runtime or something like that. You look mm, at it off the bat before you go. Yeah. You, and don't drink more than like a small size drink. Cause then you're gonna have to use the bathroom for sure. Yeah. You're not lasting that three hours, but uh, no, I think it was great. I, I got I a pretty think, big bladder actually. Do you? I think so. Okay. All right. Well, Maybe enlarged, you. which isn't, I don't think that's a good thing, but mm. yeah, I can hold some pee. Oh, good for you. Yeah. 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 Um, guy's going to make it big guys. Uh, he's got a big bladder. So, um, but yeah, I, uh, I think it was, it was worth all three hours. Uh, every shot mattered. Batman was like more of a, 
I like the whole thing with Batman is that he's more of like an inspector type, like a just like figuring crimes he's a detective, out. Detective, not he's not inspector. Gadget. That's what I meant, and he's I can never detective. think of the word detective. He's more of a yeah. detective, right? And this was like the first, I believe, true detective type Batman movie. There's still action, don't get me wrong, but it's not just stuff like going crazy the entire time. And uh, it's a lot of good dialogue. Batman's in almost every single scene. It's it's incredible. I, I really did enjoy it. And I'm not yeah. a huge like superhero DC Marvel whatever. Um, I go see the movies. I'm not like a super fan by any means, but it was it was really good. It was really well done. Well, hopefully I'll be able to find some time. Maybe maybe this weekend I'll be able to go and see it. Mm-hmm. Carmen keeps asking me like, when are you gonna go see it? I'm like, well, I gotta leave you and the kids for like three hours. If it wasn't that long, I probably would have seen it by now. But right. you gotta like carve time out to to go see that. But I'll definitely check that out. Yep. All right, Luke, uh, before we get into the magic, uh, let's go ahead and just take care of some housekeeping things. So first of all, a shout out to our patrons. You can find us at patreon.com slash the six man show if you want to help uh, financially support the show. And we shout out our patrons every single episode. Shout out core cousins, Drew Gooden, Armin, Keith Garcia, Zico, Carson Tulo, Nathan Lynn, Ellis, Jonathan Borges, Norm L, Magic Player History, Julio, Bailey, Matt Lyman, Eric Segovia, Gabe Gaines. Okay. Some big news uh, came out this week, Luke. Um, I believe that was, we're recording this Wednesday, so it came out Tuesday. The Magic officially announced that Jonathan Isaac would be out the rest of the season. Uh, We are largely going to spend time talking about that on today's episode. However, something did happen last night that uh, you alluded to, but I feel like we have to talk about it at least for a a few minutes here. Uh, The Nets came to town to take on the Orlando Magic. Uh, the Nets, I believe, um, are sitting at um, – where are they in the, the standings in terms of the Eastern Conference? I, I probably should have looked Further that up before back we started here. you would here. think that the they're Nets eighth. should be – Yeah, eighth. They're eighth. So they're they're very much uh, you know kind of fighting to get out of that play-in range. How much would you hate – behind the Cavaliers. How much would you hate to be a one seed and if the Nets ended up as an eight seed? That would just be brutal. I would – I would hate that very much. Um, you and I have joked about this. You know, we had the uh, the shoot the shot, um, you know, portion of the show that we would do. R.I.P. to shoot the shot. Mm-hmm. It's all right. You guys didn't like it. That's Charles totally fault. fine. Yeah. Uh, maybe. No. <laughs> um, but we joked multiple times about the Nets probably want like the eighth seed or some kind of lower seed. Mm-hmm. That way, they at least through the right. Eastern Conference playoffs, and I mean at this rate into yes. the finals. They could maximize Kyrie Irving if, uh, you know, a New York court City, advantage is what we would call it. Exactly. If New York City doesn't, you know, kind of lift the, you know, the, the vaccine mandates that they still kind of have in place there. So um, anyways, we thought maybe we would have a chance coming into this game, but uh, I don't think we counted on Kyrie Irving. Dropping Kyrie his. didn't think we had a chance. Uh, I don't even know if he knew coming into this game that he was going to be as good as he was. 60 points, 20 of 31 from the floor, 8 of 12 from the three-point line, 12 of 13 from the foul line. He was just incredible. Um, just nothing the Magic did uh, We could slow Kyrie down or, or stop him. 40 points in the first half. Uh, Magic lose this game by 42 points, Luke. Um, I think that's the biggest loss of the season. Hey, turnover it battle is, is close, baby. That's a that's a. That's a moral victory. Well, I mean, it, it is what that it is. is. And to be fair, absurd. the Magic offense Magic wasn't terrible won. in this game. So, yeah. The Magic won the yeah. turnover battle, by the way. 13 to yeah. 12. So, um, uh, you know, it's just, uh, it is what it is. But the Nets were just 150 ridiculous. points, uh, the most the Magic have ever given up in a game. Not awesome. When you think that the defense was on the up and up, and then regardless of, like, who was out, still stinks to give up 150 once you kind of start to establish a defensive identity. Uh, yeah, which you kind of saw go out the window. I mean, you're down 18 at the end of the first quarter, and you're like, okay, maybe, you know, we kind of still have a shot. And then when you look up, uh, you're down 30 at halftime, and you're like, oh, Kyrie's got 40 already. I mean, not uh, you know, not going per uh, particularly well, you know. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I, I don't want to spend too much time talking about this game, Luke. If you guys didn't watch the game, just know that Kyrie Irving ensured the Magic had absolutely zero chance to win this game. Yeah. Um, the the Nets honestly came out on fire offensively. Just, yeah, I, I was just gonna say if you if you aren't gonna watch the game in the entirety and you want to see at least part of it, get the, the, the gist of it. 
just look up Kyrie Irving 60 points on YouTube and that just watch those because that that's really the gist of it. And you'll see just like the type of shots that he Stupid. was making. It just you just look up and you're like, "Oh, there's no way that shot is going in." Sure enough, you know, it it would go in. Mm-hmm. So the Nets they shot 74% in the first quarter, 50% in the thir- in the second quarter. Um we're going to the third quarter here. 52% in the third quarter. And 60% in the fourth quarter. For the entire game, they shoot 60%. When you don't have a single quarter that you shoot under 50% for the game, the other team just does not stand a chance. I, I kind of hate to say that. but Yeah, and and they, they also shot Jonathan 60, you know, 59% from three, which was better than the Magic's 37.9% from the field. Uh, the fun fact I want to give, and this is the last thing I really care to say about this game, Every player on the Magic roster took a three uh, in this game. So take that for what you will. None of them shot it awesome from three besides Franz, uh, Dell, one for one. Chumo was three for nine. Fultz Cole was 0 for, for one. Six. Ross was 0 for two. It, yeah, and, and, and Cole for three for six. So it was just like wasn't a wasn't a particularly place. terrible game from the Magic offensively. They just couldn't do anything to stop Kyrie. And, you know, Kyrie, you know, I I think there's a good argument for Kyrie being one of, if not the most skilled basketball player to ever play in the NBA. And he had the the best night, the best game of his career, Uh, basically what it comes down to against the Magic last night. And and sometimes, Luke, that just happens. Uh, No matter what you do, you're on the wrong side of history. I don't think it says anything, you know, particularly profound about the Nets. I don't think it says anything particularly profound about the Magic. That we didn't already know. That we didn't already know. Uh, I think there's a good chance that Kyrie is on the way that he was on last night. The result would be similar for probably half of the league. So you got to just tip your hat to Kyrie Irving and uh, and we move on to be completely fair. All right, Luke, one last thing that I want to do before we start talking about uh, Jonathan Isaac is we started to run the Tankathon on each episode that we have here. So uh, And we've done unaware, terrible every time. Yep, we've done basically the fifth pick every single time. We're hoping that's going to change tonight. If you don't know what Tankathon is, you can go to tankathon.com. They have an NBA draft lottery simulator. You can simulate the the lottery. You can look at you know an NBA mock draft. You can actually look at the uh, percentage of odds that the Magic or any other team have of you know receiving any of those um, you know lottery picks there. So really great resource. Uh, we like to run it this time of the year when the Magic are you know really in the hunt. Uh, for ping pong balls, if you will, we're going to go ahead and simulate the lottery once and then share our results. Luke, are you ready? I don't think so, but go ahead. All right, let's hold our breath. Mm-hmm. The Magic got the second pick. Wow, hey. I'm okay with that. Hey. Uh, Oklahoma City jumps three spots to number one. Screw them. Sacramento jumps up three spots to number three. Mm. Portland jumps up four spots to number four. Houston, who they currently have you know, the top odds, I guess, uh, you know, well, they're number one. They still have the same type of odds that the Magic do, uh, but they fall four spots all the way to five. So it just goes to show you anything can, can happen to any team at any time in the lottery. It's the first time that we got good results, so let's be happy about that. Let's go ahead and look at a mock draft. So that would uh, NBA, uh, the, the Tankathon NBA mock draft has Chet Holmgren going number one. He would go to OKC, and we would get Jabari Smith Jr. from Auburn at number two. I would be totally fine. If mm-hmm. that's the way that the the draft shook out, honestly, last year, like you say, oh yeah, like top three, you know what I mean. I was really, really sold on Jalen Green, but I would say I I would be happy with Jabari, Paolo, or Chet. Any of those three guys, you know, end up going to the Magic. You know, I'll find a way to sleep that night. Don't you guys worry. <laughs> okay, Luke, let's get down to the nitty gritty. Let's get down to business uh, you you know, to defeat the Huns. Mm, yeah, okay. you, you know it, baby. What's, what's up? Yeah, you know me a little bit too well. That's scary. <laughs> All right, let's get down to business, not to defeat the Huns, um, but to talk about Jonathan Isaac. Mm. All right, so uh, early-ish uh, Tuesday morning, uh, our friend Kobe Price, friend of the podcast, new beat writer for the Orlando Magic with the Orlando Sentinel, uh, he tweeted out that uh, a league source had told him that Jonathan Isaac uh, was soon to be ruled out for the remainder of the season by the Magic. And I would say within like 10, 15 minutes, um, the official news came from the Orlando Magic PR account that Jonathan Isaac would be ruled out for the remainder of the season. 
And then um, after practice on Tuesday, the media got to meet with Jonathan Isaac. And then shortly after that, Jeff Weltman as well. So um, basically, um, I'm going to summarize and then I want to go through some quotes here. And then Luke and I can really get into the conversation. Um, I'll talk, we'll talk about Jeff Weltman first. Uh, so he essentially what he told the media is that uh, they are they were just running out of time. Uh, the way that the training staff likes to have a, a gradual ramp up of the player activity, um, they just kind of ran out of runway uh, for Jonathan to have like a realistic return to the lineup this season. He said that the rehab essentially is going to take a little longer than we had hoped, that he's been playing with contact in the half court for a little while now, and he also said that there hasn't been a setback. So that's about five quotes that I took directly from Jeff Weltman's media availability um, to say, you know, that Jonathan Isaac will not see the floor for the rest of the year. So Luke, I know that we've both seen, you know, both Mm -hmm. of these videos here. I want to try to avoid um, any of the quotes from Jonathan Isaac just yet. I want to get to that um, in just a few minutes, Mm -hmm. but what, what do you take from, you know, Jeff Weltman's, um, you know, comments and kind of the way that the, the front office, you know, management and the training staff has, you know, kind of handled the injury so far. So obviously I I don't think it goes without, you know, I think it goes without saying, but we would have liked a little more communication, you know, like this, the rest of the, like the, you know, through the, the duration, right. At least like halfway through the year to start updating us. It was nice to hear him talk about it. Even if it was the fact that he's going to be out the rest of the year, the the thing that made me feel the best, and maybe it did you, maybe you don't buy it, I don't know, but that when he said that there there were no setbacks, there wasn't a setback, and essentially what you can take from that is that either this is just like a still like a tanking thing, where like oh we we probably could have gotten Ji back sooner and he's been doing half court, whatever, um, but we just haven't. Right, we ran out of runway. Whatever his quote was, right? I I don't know. I I I don't know what it was. Maybe it just is that Ji's body is taking longer. There was you know more to it. Whatever it might be, but but it's good that you know that that he was able to say there was no setbacks. I think that was the most encouraging thing for me, and I'm hoping that uh, that means good things for Ji in the future. I hope that he continues to recover well. We at this point primary you know priority number one is that ji is healthy by night one of the nba season uh the next nba season in 2022 23 yeah and one quote um actually that i should add is Mm -hmm. jeff waltman did say you know right now the goal is to have him ready for opening night of next Mm -hmm. season so Mm -hmm. although this front office does not put timetables on player returns from injuries and rehabilitation and everything like that he actually said this is a great example of why we don't do that because the rehab is taking longer than we had hoped, and we're just kind of letting Jonathan's body respond to treatment, and basically he will get there when he gets there. I'm right there with you, Luke. I would have liked to hear something to this effect sooner yeah. from management earlier in the season. You know, we heard Jonathan Isaac before the season in a podcast that he did with Will Kane, basically saying, him returning by Christmas was a reasonable projection. Right. That's a quote from Jonathan Isaac. And as it became more apparent, you know, to the magic, and I'm guessing this has been going on for quite some time. This isn't just a a brand new development for them. I mean, we're in the middle of March at this point. At some point, probably a few months ago, my guess would be even prior to that, they realized that he kind of wasn't on the timeline that they had hoped for. And when they're being asked about that, I think you can just put that out there. I don't think you are gaining anything by waiting until now to yeah. say this. I don't think you are you know, gaining more goodwill or, or gaining more trust from Jonathan Isaac by waiting to this point to put this information out there. I, I think it's kind of the same you know, result if we hear this in December or even January when we're literally freaking out we haven't heard anything the same result in i mean like obviously it's not going to change the rehab Mm -hmm. it's not going to speed up the process of him coming back 
like I said, I don't think it's you know going to cause Jonathan Isaac not to trust them or you know right. to, to feel um, you know that the the organization was somehow doing something wrong to him by letting that information out. I think it only you know improves the way that fans feel about how transparent or the the lack of transparency from the organization. And at that point, it kind of helps to change Magic fans' expectations. This whole season, up until I don't know, maybe the last month, people have just kind of given up completely the fact that we weren't going to see him back. There are plenty of people that, you know, whatever you want to say, was it a lucky guess or whatever that have said we weren't going to see him this season. Mm. Um, I think people that were saying that earlier in the season didn't have much reason to say that and were just kind of being pessimistic. But I also might being biased, I'll admit that. But um, yeah, I don't think you would have lost anything um, by letting this information out earlier. Do, do you think and it allows Magic fans to you know kind of change their expectations? And then now we kind of all just accept, we're like we're glad that you guys said it, but we all knew it already. Right? Do you think the front office told Ji the moment they knew that he probably wouldn't be back this year, or do they just kind of do you think that they continued? And it's all speculation, obviously. Do you think they just continued to let him rehab, do his thing, but quietly knew he there's a great possibility he doesn't come back this season? Because J.I. was clearly like putting out stuff, like saying stuff to like Will Kane, whatever. Um, and even John Hammond was saying this type of stuff, like before the season started. That at some point, I just start to think that maybe J.I. didn't really know and front office was kind of like, keep going. You know, continue to rehab and, you know, we'll we'll take the days as they come. I, I just could. I just don't know. I certainly hope that's not the case because mm-hmm. I feel like that's counterproductive to everything that they've preached about, you know, wanting to protect the players and, right. you know, keep the players trust. I think you're just asking for like bad will at that point by misleading a player. So I, right. I certainly hope that's not the case. Mm-hmm. But some of the things like you mentioned in that Will Kane interview, he basically said, if it was up to him, you know, he'd be playing opening night. And then returning by Christmas was a reasonable projection. So now we are, you know, basically three months past Christmas, and now he's out for the rest of the season. I don't think I can answer the rest of your question without getting into the Jonathan Isaac quotes. Right. So I think I think that's where I'll go now. Yeah. So one of the questions that he was asked, I believe it was by Kobe Price, if I'm if I'm not mistaken. But basically, when was the decision made? Uh, and when did you have the conversation basically that you weren't going to be coming back this season? And Jonathan Isaac said it, and, and I quote, it wasn't that long ago. We've had conversations for the last week about what it would take to get me going, to ramp up, to be able to possibly make it on the court. And it just doesn't seem feasible with how much time we have left. So that tells me, and just from, you know, kind of analyzing Jonathan's body language and, you know, some of the way that he was responding to some of these questions, I kind of have the feeling that he feels like he's ready and has been ready for some time. Mm -hmm. And then realizing, you know, they're getting to the, you know, end of the year. I'm guessing the medical staff didn't ask him like, Oh, how do you feel about coming back? I think it was Jonathan went to the medical staff and was like, Hey, we've got a month left of the season. I really want to get out there. What can we do to get me out there? And that was basically the point where they had the conversation that, you're not really far enough along where we want you to be in the rehabilitation process for a, allow us to go through kind of this final s- stage or final phase of the rehab. So at this point, you know, you're probably not going to be back on the floor this season. Right. Yeah. And I, obviously that's speculation and whatever, but, and who knows, like J.I. might be super tight with the medical staff and I'm sure at this point he's gotten to know them pretty well uh, to where it could have been more of a casual thing. Who knows? Uh, maybe he did he did know and we're just taking things just blowing it out of proportion but that's what we do with quotes right like we're able to 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 analyze and that interview is there forever we're able to just kind of like overthink these things but it just seems like we were getting mixed signals and i i don't i I mean i don't really appreciate it to be honest like it's not super awesome that that this is like we already like we shouldn't know before that it's announced and just by this, the just for the mere fact that the writing on the wall, right? For the mere fact that it's March, and we've not seen Ji when he's been being like he's been literally teased to us 
multiple times up to this point. And we then, you know, we're just kind of, I mean, you've been saying it obviously. And, you know, we've gotten on board with like, I don't know, man, it, it, it seems unlikely. So yeah, like you said, the people at the beginning of the season that were like, you know, oh, he's not coming back for the rest of the year. And then like his political stuff, you know, comes out, whatever you want to make of it. And then people are like, yeah, he's definitely not coming back. Well, yeah, those I would I would say that those comments kind of you know were were hand in hand. They uh, were like, and it, it, it's unfortunate. I wish we could kind of you know just just get away and and kind of separate what you feel about the person versus you know how yep. you feel about the player. But it's become very apparent that there are a lot of people that cannot separate uh, those two. No, they can't. Which is why like they didn't want they they were saying Ji is not going to come back till next year. They were saying. You know, I, I'd feel more comfortable if he wasn't on the team. Get get out of here, first of all. Um, second of all, like... The real it, wild things are like, oh, we should just cut J.I. Yeah, we should cut him. That's the crazy... You know, I mean, or, even if you don't want him on the team, you certainly don't wave or cut J.I. No, it's just people were letting their minds get foggy because their opinions were what they were. So, whatever. Um, but, yeah, so, I mean... Is what it is with J.I., man, but but it is, you know, a little frustrating that we're <laughs> had to wait till March to get an update on like a cornerstone player. All right. So I've got some some direct quotes uh basically from that media availability that I wanted to share. Yeah. That I feel were, you know, really important. So first of all, he's asked, you know, you know, how do you feel? And he says, body wise, I, I feel good. Um also is asked, you know, how does it feel to, you know, to keep working and, and not being able to return? He says it's frustrating. Um, you know, kind of when asked about what happened and, and why he's not going to make it uh, on the floor at this time, he says, you know, we kind of just ran out of time. He also said, I want nothing more than to be on the floor with my teammates. Um, I, I kind of talked about, um, you know, the conversations that he's had with the medical staff in terms of uh, trying to, to come back. Um, then he was asked if from, I believe this was Kobe Price again, he was asked, when the injury happened, was there an expectation that it was going to be kind of like a prolonged mm. uh, rehabilitation? And if you remember, um, initially it was just to believe it was just believed to be the ACL. But when he had surgery, mm. they fa- found out it was the ACL and it was the meniscus. And if you remember anything about Al Farouk Aminu's injury, the meniscus is like a very tricky thing. I believe with Markel, it was just the ACL. Mm. If I'm not mistaken. Whenever the meniscus is also involved, it just makes the rehabilitation process a, a bit more tricky there. Um, but Jonathan said, you know, there was no, um, you know, kind of prolonged, um, you know, prolonged expectation it was going to be a longer rehab. And then says, has it taken longer than we've hoped and expected? Yes. In terms of building the muscle around my knee and everything, it's taken a bit longer than we wanted it to, but it's just been a day by day process. Is then asked, um, you know, seeing other guys that were hurt after you with the same injury and then coming back, is that frustrating? He says, I mean, yeah, it sucks. Pretty animated at a J.I. Kind of some of the most emotion that we've seen at a J.I. And then um, it's also brought up that he's been cleared for full contact in the half court, mm-hmm. uh, that he's been banging down low, been able to handle the ball, go into contact and finish uh, without any issues. It's really just been my conditioning, you know, the pace getting up and down the floor. So, all of that to say kind of what we can infer is that he's been cleared for full contact in the half court. Um, He mentioned multiple times and alluded to the fact that the next step is getting full contact in the full court, um, which includes, you know, getting up and down, kind of getting his conditioning back and hitting those uh, conditioning benchmarks. Mm -hmm. These NBA guys, they have to be able to run the floor a certain amount of time, you know, uh, in a certain amount of time. Um, you know, to, to be able to make their conditioning, you know, benchmarks. A lot of teams have this famously like the Miami heat go crazy with their conditioning. Um, so his conditioning, um, basically isn't at the point that the medical staff is ready for him to move into yeah. the full court. And then they spend a long time kind of ramping him up. Well, um, yeah. Oh, I just wanted to add mm-hmm. uh, really quickly that basically what has prolonged the rehab is, is the fact that they're trying to build up the muscles around his left knee and the rest of his body, you know, his upper body and everything like that, um, to get it to where the right side of his body is, uh, so that there's not any kind of imbalance to try to ensure that nothing like this is ever going to happen again to J.I. Yeah. And now, where he's at in the, the rehab, um, it sounds like he might still be working on strengthening the knee, but he kind of made it seem like, at least in my opinion, mm-hmm. that the real issue now is 
ramping up the conditioning and they just didn't have enough time to do that right. before the end of the season. And yeah, so the interview, to be honest, started out very like routine. It felt like J.I. Yeah. giving all of the right answers. He has clearly talked to, to PR and like been coached up on his responses. Here's what you say if they say this. Here's what you say if they say that. Here's what you don't say. Right. I'm sure they've got like buzzwords that like, hey, stay away from this stuff. So beginning of the interview, I am just I'm I'm sitting back in my chair, right? I'm sitting back in my chair, I'm watching this interview. And then he starts saying those comments. He's like, "Well, I've been doing, you know, full contact in the half court." And I said, "What?" He said, "And then uh right now like I just haven't I'm just not playing full court basically at, at full contact." So at, <laughs> at this point, Jonathan, I'm thinking I'm forgetting everything he said up to that point. Like building muscle, doing this, doing that. He uses the term that he's banging down low. He's he's do like he is full contact. He's banging bodies down there. Like at this point, like you said, you know, it, it seemed to you like it's basically about you know conditioning and that he ran out of time. So while yes, he is building muscle, more muscle maybe, obviously like constantly around there, so that this doesn't happen again. I was led to believe by like what he was saying and maybe I'm reading it incorrectly, but I was led to believe from those quotes and from watching it that he just essentially doesn't have the conditioning for it, but he might have be there muscle wise, or he's just going to be there sooner than he will be conditioning wise. I, I don't know. There's a lot of ways that you can slice it, but it was very interesting and it was not, it turned into not being a normal interview. I just feel like there was a lot of things and maybe we're just so bored and so ready for him to be back on the court that we're reading between every line and it's, and it's maybe a little too much. I don't know. Oh, well we're, we're a hundred percent doing that. I, I promise you <laughs> we're, we're, we're doing that. I probably watched that whole interview start to finish like at least four or five times at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I you know I, I thought it was pretty interesting. Again, just you know some of his body language, and I'm not you know claiming to be a a, a body language you know expert or you know um, analyst by any means. But um, you know when guys sigh or you know like kind of roll their eyes, you know you, you kind of you know you, you take something away from that. I would implore you all to go and watch the interview for yourselves, and you know, you know kind of come to your own conclusion uh, about how you felt about, you know, Jonathan's interview and, and some of the responses that he gave. But yeah, I, I think, you know, you make a good point that, you know, at least the way that I felt about it was yes, that, you know, kind of his body is ready to go, but the conditioning isn't there. But um, I feel like it's kind of open to per- interpretation a little bit right now. Cause it's, they didn't just flat out come and ask him like, is it the knee or is it just right. the conditioning? So I know there are people that, you know, still believe it. it's kind of both. Yes, he's working on the right. conditioning, but the knee isn't quite where it is. The good news is we have like seven months between now and the start of next season. So if J.I. is like anywhere, you know, within the next four to five months of being 100%, we should see him for training camp. We should see him for preseason. We should see him, you know, opening night and everything should be, you know, kind of good to go. Um on that end with J.I. So for me, it, it's good just that we finally have some more information. Uh, it's not quite as in as much detail as I would like, but um, yeah. it, it's better than nothing. And the news was expected, but at least we finally have it. The one thing that I want to um, just kind of talk about a little bit is, so we heard that Markel was starting to do some more court work in November. Mm-hmm. And then December, like 11th or December 12th, we heard that he was with the team in Los Angeles Mm -hmm. on the road trip before they took on the Lakers and that he was starting to practice, like fully practice with the team. And then it was two and a half months from that point until we saw him on the floor. So it's not like Jeff Weltman and the medical staff are just making this up for Jonathan Isaac. This goes to show they just have kind of an unorthodox way of handling injuries and rehabs. Um, And right now, the way Markel looks, it's kind of hard to argue with that. I know, Mm -hmm. especially me, you know, whether it was called for, uncalled for, appropriate or inappropriate, I know I've questioned the medical staff plenty out of uncertainty, lack of transparency from the front office, uh, frustration as a fan. Um, I'll, I'll be the first one to own up to that. But they have... They killed it with Markel. Markel, so far, so good. Looks great. 
And it honestly makes me a little bit more optimistic about Jonathan coming back. I was on a, a Twitter space with Kobe Price and a bunch of other Magic fans earlier tonight. And I just flat out asked Kobe, you know, you're closer to the team basically than anyone else. Um, what do you think are the prospects of Jonathan Isaac coming back and, and being the same player that he was, you know, in 2020 before the first injury? And he says, I don't know anything. I'm not a, a, a trainer by any means. He's like, but when I see him, he looks fine. Mm -hmm. Like he, he doesn't have any type of hindrance, has good movement and good mobility and agility and everything like that. However, to the naked eye, what an NBA player should be able to do on a floor is much different than what yeah. we are accustomed to. And and I'll give Kobe obviously the benefit of the doubt being around NBA players all the time. Um, but that made me feel at least a little bit better that, you know, you know, I, Kobe's word goes a long way with me. And um, I just thought that that was encouraging that, you know, to him, he looks fine. And, you know, I'm not trying to name drop by any means here, uh, but people know that Jonathan Isaac has been on the podcast a couple of times. Uh, you know, I, I've, I've met him in person before. I wouldn't say we're friends by any means, right. um, but obviously there's somewhat of a line of communication open there. I don't know anything when I say this. And if I did know something, I wouldn't tell you guys anyways, <laughs> but I legitimately don't know anything when I say this. I feel like Jonathan feels like he is ready. And I feel like the... The front, the front office, medical staff, forever is holding him back just because he, he might think he's ready, but he might not actually be ready. That's a real possibility. Yeah. Medical trainers, they're experts in their field. And we all know that so far in this season, it is kind of to the Magic's benefit to be competitive but also lose games. And if you had J.I. and Markel for a large chunk of this season, yeah. that is going to greatly impact um, you know, kind of the, the goal of, of this season, if you will. Yeah. Just my two cents. Hand, mm -hmm. hand to God, I don't know anything. Just my two cents. Yeah. Luke, anything else about this, about J.I.? No. No, I, okay. I don't have anything else. All right, Luke. Uh, well, we are going to close out the week here, uh, coming up to play Detroit. Um, yeah, Detroit on Thursday at 7 o'clock, and then the Oklahoma City Thunder Sunday at 6 o'clock. Detroit, Luke, you start looking at the injury report. I think it came out not too long ago that uh, that Jeremy Grant uh, probably isn't going to play tomorrow night. Yeah, Jeremy Grant is out due to right knee inflammation. Rodney Magruder day to day with a hamstring. Frank Jackson is out with a back injury. Hamadou Jallo is out with a finger injury. Cade Cunningham is questionable for Thursday's game against the Magic due to an illness. And then obviously with the Magic, Jonathan Isaac Bull Bull are still out. Jalen Suggs has been uh, ruled out with the right ankle injury. Chuma Okiki with a knee contusion is day-to-day -day right now. And then Wendell Carter Jr. with a right ankle sprain as well is also day-to-day -day and questionable for tomorrow's game or today's game, whenever you're listening to this, uh, for the game against the Pistons. We all know that this game has major lottery implications. Uh, it seems like a battle of who can sit the most guys uh, tonight for that game to see who can lose. And, um, yeah, the Magic right now are a half game behind the Detroit Pistons. So you, you've got to think about, you know, how the Magic feel going into this game. To me, it's pretty clear that the Pistons are trying to lose the game. Yeah, I mean, you look at it, Jonathan. Dell right now is essentially questionable, right? Sog's already been ruled out. I don't. I would not be shocked if if these guys sit tomorrow and they just... yeah. And they just play the the deepest bench. Um, I it wouldn't shock me at all. A lot and of you got uh, the, Brasdakis and Schofield minutes. Lovely, maybe some Brazdakis. Robin Lopez. Um, I think you could have to play Robin. Um, but uh, and then what? You got the the Thunder after that. So it's just kind of the battle of the the doo doo teams and who wants to uh, who wants to lose more. Oklahoma that City time of year. also has a a pretty. Um, interesting uh injury report right now mm -hmm. uh josh giddy probably is going to be out at least for a couple of weeks uh with a hip injury uh jeremiah jeremiah robinson earl uh he's been out um he fractured his foot in february uh lou dort uh he had soldiers a shoulder surgery uh he's out for the rest of the season as well it's been a while since i've uh 
caught up on my Oklahoma City Thunder <laughs> injury report. But um, yeah, they've got you, you quite think, a few guys out. You right think now. that they just like like tanking teams, like blatantly tanking teams? They're like, all right, guys. Uh, it's like in the middle of the season. They're like, all right, guys. Why don't you guys start to kind of assess yourselves? Any surgeries that you guys are thinking yeah. about getting? That shoulder feeling a little weird there, Lou. <laughs> like, do you, do you need to I work it out? Not. Uh, I hope not, but you can't put anything past the Thunder. No, I mean, and, and teams in general, like teams that want to tank, they're like, I don't know, I was going to just wait till the off season to get this surgery done, and not that this is the case with Lou Dort, because I honestly have no idea. Um, but yeah, it just makes you makes you think. I, I think that there'd be some pretty, we'd see some things behind the scenes, and we'd be like, wow, I cannot believe that that happens. Well, last season, the way they handled the whole SGA foot Ooh, thing, yeah, all my uh, all my faith in the Oklahoma City Thunder. I mean, they they employ you know Rob Hennigan, so how much can you trust them? You know, it's what I true. Mean? So, it's true. Luke, I think that's going to do it for this episode. What do you think? Yeah, I think we're uh, we're good to go. And as you guys listen to this, we'll be mentally preparing for uh, the Detroit Pistons. Hopefully, we see JI, um, you know, in the next seven months. That would really do a lot for my mental health. Mm -hmm. I would uh, really, really appreciate that and uh, prefer to see him play uh, opening night of next season. So let's all hope for that. That'd be great. All right, folks, for Luke Sylvia, this has been Jonathan Osborne. You guys are listening to the Six Man Show, and we will catch you guys next time. See ya. Thanks for listening to the Six Man Show. Be sure to subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, and Stitcher to get new episodes downloaded directly to your phone. Please take a minute to give us a five-star rating and a review. It would really help us out a lot. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Six Man Show and like us on Facebook. We'll catch you guys next time. Go Magic!